I think if we can educate our kids well, then it's our best chance to have a better world. And why do we still believe that we're the same person? You've grown, you've matured, but you still are the same person. And sometimes I joke with students and I say, I did everything I could not to get a real job. They bother me because I made the decision. But there nof nothing is ever going to put us on our knees. Very early in my life, I realized that having access to knowledge was kind of a critical way. Happiness is not measured by a sign of dollars. It's measured by the level of liberty that you have. As a species, probably we'll survive. I mean, there's 7.6 billion of us. You can't get rid of us that easy. And that is a wrap. Today we have uh, my good friend and mentor, uh, Rene Bousquet. And Rene is you know one of the most uh, i would say knowledge acquiring individuals i know and we'll explain what that means and knowledge sharing individuals um, he was the president of uh, fighter mobile which is a leading um, cellular uh, company in canada and that exited to another cellular company for over a billion dollars um, he is currently um, the chief commercial officer, is that correct? Yeah, yes. At, 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 at Terrastar. So he's moved from cellular to now satellites. And so that's an interesting, you know, space. Um, and his background has been in partly in marketing, if I'm correct. And finance. And finance. So, so we have a lot to cover and discuss today. Um, we'll start by just sharing, you know, Renee and I were having a conversation before this, which was around you know, what we as young folks or young individuals should be looking to do. And, and it's all about what he calls acquisition of knowledge, sharing of knowledge, and retention of knowledge and keeping it relevant. And that's more or less his life philosophy. So uh, with that, welcome to the show, Renee. It's a pleasure. Cool. So, so maybe let's, let's start out by talking about your personal journey. I, I, know, I know it's fascinating because, you know, you came from, you know, a place of not many means and, 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 and an environment where knowledge was, was not actually encouraged. Can, can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, ex actually, uh, I was born in a remote area of Quebec in the Eastern Townships, and uh, my father had uh, a farm, a pretty, pretty successful farm. Uh, actually, my grandfather was one of the founders of a company that became, you know, AgroPure. Uh, oh, wow. which is a large, you know, uh, agro company in Canada. But nobody in my family had more than uh, uh, a, a high grade, uh, a high school grade, high school. you know. So uh, having access to knowledge and education was not really something valued. They were successful businessmen, and for them, you know, this is something that was not really necessary to, to, to uh, achieve your dream in life. So uh, you know, that was their point of view, but I was a very curious guy. And I felt very isolated, you know, in that, in that area. And uh, for me, very early in my life, I realized that having access to knowledge was kind of a critical way right. to bring some, something to a community and uh, to your friends. And uh, if you want to be accepted in a group and in a team, you need to be able to bring something to that group. So just to give you an idea of uh, how I felt, you know, uh, in, in 1967, uh, my father, you know, uh, decided to uh, to bring us, you know, to the international uh, exhibition in Montreal. Right. Uh, and uh, for me, I recall that moment as a very important moment in my life because when we crossed the bridge, the Champlain Bridge that day, I finally realized that there were people speaking French outside of my uh, village. Oh, wow. And for me, it was kind of, wow, this world is really cool. I'm not alone. And I want to know that world. So the first part of my life was really focused on, okay, now, now that I know that there is a lot of knowledge, you know, everywhere, how can I acquire that? And it became kind of the first real challenge of my life. I had to convince my, uh, my father at one point that, you know what, uh, if I cannot com continue my education, uh, I think, you know, I will uh, find my own way. And uh, after, you know, a while, 
then right. they, 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 they realized, my parents realized that this, this was maybe an opportunity and I became the first one in the family to go to uh, university. Wow. So uh, in, this, this, in this exercise, you know, I focused on finance, I focused on marketing, I got a bachelor, I got a master's in science. Uh, so I wanted to have the quantitative side and as well as the emotional, more creative side of marketing because I really felt that uh, you could do everything with the numbers if you can put a story around that. Right. Uh, and, and so it's interesting that uh, usually, you know, to in today, it's the other way around, meaning um, kids don't want to go to school or college and, you know, they rather play video games or do other interesting stuff. And parents are like, no, you have to go to college. So what led, I'm curious, what, what was the rationale behind, you know, your, your father's hesitant to send you to school and education? Well, I think this was the old way, you know, of rural Quebec. If you go back 50, 60 years ago, uh, it was not uh, seen as something uh, uh, that would bring anything good to your life. Uh, it, I think it was only a lack of, of, of lack of understanding of understanding right. what knowledge could bring to someone. And there was also other uh, th there there were also other reasons because you know my parents were expecting me to be uh, taking uh, taking the pharma uh, to the next right. the next step the next right. generation and i think you know they were looking at uh, becoming educated as a threat more than as something that would add value to the family okay. th th that was the mindset of the uh, of that time and uh, but you know the, the, that it changed a lot because once you know uh, I, I was able to convince my father that going to a university was something interesting. He started to be very curious where it would lead me. Okay. And uh, actually, when I uh, graduated and I found my uh, my first job at Pricewaterhouse Coopers in, in Montreal, they were all impressed because they couldn't believe that I could find a job for such <laughs> a company. Wow. So then it it's, it changed everything. I became kind of a hero, you know, for him and. Uh, and, but that was also a uh, confirmation that my choice of fighting for knowledge, acquiring maximum knowledge, you know, during the first years of my life was really the right thing to do. And, and so it's, I'm curious, you know, you, came, you grew up in a family where knowledge wasn't, you know, the priority. And somehow you got the bug. So do you think that's... Uh, part genetics or socialization like what happened because you weren't really you know the socialization wasn't around knowledge acquisition but you were just fascinated by it i was fascinated fascinated by what you can do with knowledge right and you know the more you uh, learn the more you realize that you don't know anything yeah it's kind of a machine Absolutely. you know it's a it's a circle you know the more you learn the more you want to learn and i think this is basically what saved what saved the most of us and uh, what actually what saved me to some extent because once you understand that you can contribute to a society uh, yeah. to a community and if you can contribute to a community that community will give you back uh, immense you know uh, return and for me it's important in life to feel that right uh, and and so you went to PWC and from there, you ended up in the cellular world and telecom. Walk us through that. Yeah, m maybe the first thing is to understand what I was able to accomplish at, uh, at PwC. Okay, you know, yeah. When I arrived there, you know, I was uh, full of confidence that I, I had learned a lot of stuff you know, at, uh, at the university, particularly. You're like every university grad in the world. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, you know, we graduated. We're the best. We'll show. We'll show everyone how it's done. Yeah. Yeah, but my 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 goal was not as much as showing that I knew a lot, as much as showing people what could be uh, improved if I were able to, uh, if I was able to implement right. that knowledge in the organization. Wow. So this is at that moment that in my life I I was kind of half and half continuing to acquire knowledge, but starting to share what I had learned before. Right. It was kind of a transition. 
but very early at Price Waterhouse, I, I started, you know, hard coding models of um, consumer behavior stuff. You know, at the beginning of the eight nineties, wow. you didn't have a lot of tools to do that. You had to to <laughs> do it the hard way. That was very rewarding because only a couple of years after I started to do that type of things, you know, the numbers right. I was producing with my models were used at Business News. Uh, in Canada to demonstrate, for instance, what could be the impact of uh, the implementation of the new GST at that time on consumer behavior and stuff like that. So, uh, so for me, it was a, a, real, a real indication that I could have an impact. Right. And I started to feel with that impact that more respect and also people were starting to help me achieving more and starting to share their own knowledge with me. S that, that was really a transition. Uh, but af after, let's say, four or five years of doing that, uh, I had a lot of, uh, of questioning what I would do next. Uh, and uh, one day, I got a call from a guy I uh, worked, worked with on a project. Uh, and uh, he told me, you know what, there is this, this guy called Charles Sirois. Uh, who is currently uh, developing a new project uh, for a, uh, a new uh, wireless network in Canada. And he has this, this, this vision of one day people will, uh, will get born you know, with a phone number and they will keep that phone number for the rest of their life until they die. Yeah, and that we're here and today. And, and that <laughs> was, you know, at that time, it was kind of a crazy idea. Nobody, you know, could imagine that this would become the world we're, we're in. And I was inspired by that because for me, that was the ultimate chase for knowledge. Uh, right. It was tra using your knowledge to transform the world. And I decided to join the group. Uh, and to there were a lot of very... Uh, knowledgeable people uh, who decided the same thing and this is why I ended up you know in this uh, in this wireless business yeah. uh, and, and one thing I want to point out to folks is what was interesting about uh, Fido mobile uh, which was in its in its era I think in the 90s the disruptor of the uh, cellular or telecom industry in Canada was um, before that, there was a concept of um, you know a landline plus you have you know cell phones, but I think Fido really kind of like pushed towards um, you don't really need a landline. Just that whole concept around that. Yeah, uh, it was done in uh, different phases, but the first phase was that uh, in 1996, as you mentioned, uh, very few people had a wireless phone in Canada. I think the penetration rate at that time was less than six percent. That's crazy. And it was wow. what we call the analog uh, wireless phones uh, at that <laughs> wow. time. It was kind of a brick of uh, uh, nearly five pounds, you know, that you had to uh, to bring with you. And uh, the price was extremely high as well. It was a product that people were using only for business purposes and stuff like that. It was explained as a technology kind of a mysterious thing uh, that only wise people could have access All to. All the rich, basically. And, yeah. and then when Fido arrived, well, I would say first it was Microsoft company and we needed to find a, a brand for our right. service. And we had that uh, vision internally that if we were to implement uh, that vision that one day everybody will have uh, their uh, phone number, it, it has to become a friendly uh, device. It right. has to be seen as something that is not technology, right. but useful in your life. And then we said, okay, what kind of, uh, of a brand we could give to that service uh, to change the mindset that this is a technological uh, device that nobody understands. And we said, geez, uh, it has to be seen as a, a friendly uh, service. And what else than Fido? Fido is, is, is the friendliest you know, uh, uh, dog you can have. Yeah. You know, it follows you everywhere. It, it, it brings a lot of emotion to your daily lives. And we said, geez, uh, it will follow uh, you in your pocket for the rest of your life. And we said, geez, uh, in addition, the, the awareness of such a brand name was such that instantly we became one of the most known uh, brand in the country. Right, uh, yeah. Uh, right after the launch. And we, we need to recall as well that uh, when we launched in 1996, we were the first 2G uh, wireless network in North America. 
Oh, wow, North America. Uh, in North America, wow. even before OmniPoint in New York, which became Verizon. And okay, uh, wow. This is an important aspect. November 30th, 1996, when we launched, we, we became, by default, uh, the first company launching text messaging in North America. Wow. And at that time, we knew it would be something that would make a difference. But uh, we have not imagined how big it would become. And we can see today what was the impact of text messaging. And I think that's true for many technologies, right? It's, it's, it's always the, you know, simple and non-obvious um, technology trends where, you know, it, it just, it's so simple that it doesn't seem that it's going to be that big. And, and people, well, investors definitely uh, underestimate, way underestimate. And founders and visionaries tend to overestimate. And so there's always this fine line. Exactly. It, it took many years as well right. be before it became very popular. Yeah. But we were true believers that this was only the first step towards something much bigger. Uh, instant messaging came after that. And now you have all these apps today, you know, which are something that you cannot avoid anymore. And for teenagers of today, without that, I think they would lose half their world, which is which is kind of what, what I call a virtual world that, right. they, that they have. So that was really the first step. Then we went through a first phase of growth, a humongous growth. Uh, and uh, we had a challenge in, uh, in the early 2000s when the bubble uh, exploded. Uh, and we That's a dot-com bubble, right? Yeah, the dot-com yeah. bubble. So and we went we ran out of cash because we, we, we had so much growth that we could not finance the growth. So we needed to restructure financially. At that time, I was, you know, the vice president of finance of, uh, of, of uh, Microsell, and uh, because they had brought me, you know, from the marketing team to the finance team at one point in the early years after the launch, because right. they needed to put, you know, a marketing twist to the financial plan so we could convince investor to finance the company. We were looking for $2 billion of financing at that time. So, so that's where you know my finance and marketing background became very useful because I was capable to talk uh, the marketing language to financial people right. and I was able to talk the financial language to marketing people so I could bridge you know, uh, the two groups uh, uh, which are usually fighting each other uh, w within an, uh, an organization. And, and that's an interesting point I want to touch on a little bit. Um, it's a sense of, we're not talking about genderless, but you know, folks or people or individuals who have expertise in, one, in more than one domain. Um, it's, it's a rare skill set and it has its benefits. So for example, on my end, um, you know, I started out by coding and, and developing, and you know that's that was I would say you know the, in my in my early twenties from high school till my early twenties that was it, um, and then the other half was all about now sales, biz dev, raising money, and so on, and and so when you have a sales brain and a technology brain, it's it's interesting because you can you know I agree when you said speak the language, and that is so true right they they're like each domain or expertise has its own lingo it's it's us being human beings as tribal you know in in, in nature yeah um and being able to traverse both sides uh i think it's a very incredible skill uh to have well this is a skill that you need to develop uh it's not something that you have you know right wh when you're uh when you're born i think you first you need to have in to show interest interest in, yeah in, absolutely in, in other uh, points of view and other sectors than your main uh, interesting uh, sectors. Um, and, and also in my case, you know, since I had studied in finance and marketing and, and plus, you know, on the marketing side, I, I did a lot of research in the quantitative aspects of that. So I knew how to build models, algorithms and stuff like that. I was even interested by the engineering side of a wireless network. So it helped me a lot because at one point, right. if you need to get in the middle of uh, some arbitration, you can un understand the different points of view of the different groups and then you can ask the right questions and then you can bring the people together. So all together, they start to trust each other and realize the value that the others uh, can bring to a discussion. Right. And this is a beginning of what I call, you know, creating a winning team. 
Uh, and when uh, when uh, we came out of the restructuring process, you know, at Microsoft in 2002, I had done, uh, I had l led, you know, the restructuring of all the operations, you know, within Microsoft. We needed to change a lot of, of structures, processes. Uh, we needed to uh, eliminate a certain number of resources. But we came out much stronger than what we were before. We had yeah. a, a much more efficient, you know, uh, group of people. Then I was given a challenge you know, at that time because I, I knew so much, you know, what was uh, negotiated with the bankers through the restructuration. Um, they asked me to go back to the marketing. They said, uh, the marketing team, they said, now, now that you l know exactly what uh, the shareholders uh, want, yeah. you will get back to the marketing group and you will make it happen. Right. So. That was a very, uh, very exciting uh, moment for me. Uh, even, even still today, I'm, I feel emotional when I talk about that because I went back there and I was seen as the financial guy. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I needed to rebuild trust with these people. And that was not easy at the beginning, but since I knew so much, uh, so well the business plan, I was able to explain what we were trying to accomplish. And small things, you know, you need to work on uh, on the people side of the equation much more than than on the business plan side. You need to bring the people together, yeah, and and build a, a team that can trust that they can make the difference. And uh, one thing that I realized is that in that group of people, there were about sixty in the marketing in the marketing team, you know, at that time. Uh, and I was always making joke uh, using yes sir, for instance, with different tones and uh, different intensity and stuff like that and small things like that. And then I realized that in that team, there were about 40 different languages uh, spoken by the team. Wow. So I started to play games like, can I learn that in all these languages? Can I learn the tones that you're using in your language? And then I realized after a while, you know, it, it creates friendliness in the, in the team. They were starting to use things like that among themselves. And that I started to really realize that they were not fighting each other anymore. They were trying together to consider the other's point of view to make a better decision, to become more autonomous, to share their own knowledge. And this is basically what I was trying to do with that group, sharing my knowledge. And teach them how to share their knowledge so they would not rely on me anymore. They would become, you know, efficient decision makers, faster decision makers, and then we would win. Right. So when we came out of the restructuration process, our stock, you know, dropped from $15 to $9, you know, in the matter of, uh, of uh, a, a couple of weeks. Whoa. Then we started to build this new paradigm that you would not need your landline phone anymore in the future. Right. And we put together this, this concept, which was City Fido. The City Fido, your phone that you can use in the city everywhere. I remember that. Yeah. And uh, that team put that together. Uh, and uh, uh, basically it was an offering uh, at that time where it, it was $40 per month, uh, unlimited voice, uh, which was something crazy uh, unheard of and disruptive yeah. you know in the industry in a matter of a year and a half the stock you know increased from nine dollars to 35 dollars wow. and uh, we had launched the service in in vancouver and we uh first and then in toronto and when we launched in vancouver in the first three months we captured 57 percent market share wow. of uh, the the sales of the gross additions 57% of the market share, when you're facing Rogers, Bell, and Telus, you can imagine you know, how yeah. impactful it was. But we were really talking to people. So then we launched the service as well in, in Toronto, and we had a similar success. This is, this is exactly at that time that they decided you know, to eliminate us from the market. To buy you out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and we got an offer from Telus and an offer from Rogers. And the shareholders felt that at that time that was acceptable for them, and then we were uh, acquired by Rogers. So I, I'm sure the acquisition was, you know, it, it ended with a capital B, so that must have been a good outcome. But, but then here's the thing, right? You know, we see all this innovation in this space, and I'm hearing your story, and I'm like, wow, sounds like a great organization with a passionate team. 
But when you think about consumers and their perspective, whether in the U.S. or, or in Canada, um, you know, it's, it's, it's very poor of when you think about a Verizon or when you think about a Rogers here, like cell companies suck, right? Basically, <laughs> telecommunication <laughs> companies are terrible, right? Um, why is that? Well, you know, they're old cultures, eh? the, the, the int organizational cultures. I recall when we were uh, acquired by Rogers, I had the opportunity to work directly with Ted Rogers. He was a really good entrepreneur. Oh, wow. yeah. But you know, this, this, this vision of providing more value to an end user was always difficult to trade off with what a shareholder can get out you know, of a better uh, revenue uh, per user. And it was more this short-term vision of maximizing, you know, the, the revenues you would get from an end user instead of how can we build a relationship that we will grow in the next uh, five to ten years to something that will be much bigger. So, so why do you think that is? And, and I'll, I'll add another sort of uh, case study here. Um, for example, uh, Jeff Bezos is very famous for writing his letter to his shareholders of why Amazon is not going to focus on profit and they're going to reinvest. Um, and he, you know, literally told them, hey, if you don't, w don't like it, then sell your shares, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, and so that's a case of long-term thinking. And you see, sort of see this pattern, whether it's Netflix, you know, they've gone through troubled times. Is this a case that if a company is not led by a founding team, or but Ted Rogers is a founder, um, why this short-term thinking when you know you're gonna, or, or you don't see that you're gonna lose out? I take a challenge, uh, a really big challenge once you achieve success, right. is you want to remain at that level. And most of the time, uh, people are taking a defensive approach. They, right. they, they try to protect their turf instead of continuing to innovate. Uh, that's, that's really a character uh, behavior that uh, you observe in many, many organizations. Yeah. And, you have, and all the people reporting to the leaders, they also want to protect. They become adverse to change uh, because they feel they're at the top. And changing when you're at the top is always a risky business. And that creates this culture that at one point they become reluctant to look at new ideas. And the case of the wireless companies, in addition to that, they, they, since they were at the top and they had so much contributed to the change of the society, they felt they would continue to be at the top for the rest of their life. And uh, the innovation came. No matter what, they were trying to protect their turf. It came from the left field, the right field. You know, I recall in 2007 uh, when uh, we were uh, pitching to, uh, to investors in New York for uh, another project that we would create similar to uh, Fido uh, with my former colleagues of Microsoft. Right. Our vision was that the, the Internet, was going to migrate to uh, wireless infrastructures. And no way. Yeah, and I mean that sounds so far fetched. Well, we were. I'm, I'm, I'm just kidding because this, this is the world today. Yeah, and <laughs> basically they laughed at us. They said, "Look, you, you're dreaming, guys." And really? Uh, you're dreaming. Wow. And what is really interesting is that a few months later, uh, Apple launched the iPhone, and then you, <laughs> and then you saw, you know, the Google uh, uh, Android phones yeah. arriving uh, soon after that. And you saw the impact. Right. It was a massive tsunami, you know, on, on, on the explosion of wireless data. Actually, the forecast we, uh, we gave them uh, during our pitch was already, you know, surpassed. So wow. to come back to your question, uh, you can see how reluctant people can be toward uh, innovation. So I guess the real question that now becomes is, what do you think is the reason for that? And I know you mentioned protect the turf. Um, it seems clear that, you know, again, I've, I've seen this in different, you know, tech companies and, and as, as, as my organization is evolving, you know, this is like my biggest fear, which is what I call complacency, right? Um, you know, Alan Greenspan, I believe, coined this term called creative destruction, right? That defines capitalism. And, and I found that interesting because 
you know, it's important for companies to disrupt themselves because if you don't, you're going to get disrupted by somebody else, right? And we all know that, and every organization has smart individuals, but something happens, right? Once you start getting scale and you start getting, uh, you know, could be hiring execs and so on, and, and we lose the incentive mechanism from innovation to more career trajectory, if you know what I mean. Yeah, definitely. This is, uh, this is one aspect uh, in your life cycle as well, because if you've been there for many years, you have a different destination or goal as what you had, you know, in, in your early 30s. Right. For instance, when I arrived at Microsell, I was, you know, in my early 30s, and then, you know, sky was the limit, and I just wanted to achieve the top. And it, 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 drove, uh, it drove me to do things that uh, I would not be uh, willing to do today in terms of uh, level of energy I was putting in, in, in the exercise. And it's like that for, for many people. I think this is a mistake. Right. Because uh, uh, in today's world, because of the, sp the, 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 the pace of innovation, yeah. uh, if uh, you fall in that trap, basically uh, you become uh, irrelevant right. uh, in the society. Uh, you cannot really contribute to a community efficiently anymore. And particularly, you know, uh, at this time, uh, with the uh, arrival of uh, artificial intelligence and the 5G technologies that will emerge in the next five years uh, and all the machines uh, which will be uh, interconnected to th these network. So that's why in my particular case, what I decided to do is uh, I said, geez, uh, I, I need to continue increasing my knowledge right. uh, or else, you know, I will fall in the same trap. And I really felt that when I was the, 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 at uh, the presidency of FIDO. Right. Uh, my first uh, reaction when I got there is, geez, how long you feel when you get there compared to how exciting it is when you are with the working uh, the working people, you know, creating, finding ideas, yeah. uh, implementing that, reacting. The personal uh, experience that you have at that level, you kind of lose it when you arrive yeah. at the top. Uh, despite all the implications you can have in different activities, you're pulled the right and left in things that are not always interesting for you. And then you, you in my par particular case, I, I, I felt that I was becoming disconnected from what really drove me, which Kay. was acqu acquiring knowledge, sharing that knowledge, building relationship, building winning teams, you know, by doing that. And that's why I left, you know, Rogers in 2006 to go back with my former colleagues uh, at, at Microsoft because we wanted to recreate the same thing. And uh, still today I'm working with them on a new project in the satellite business. Uh, because we never feared uh, to disrupt, you know, I, to disrupt things, to uh, look at new ways to continue acquiring knowledge because... Uh, so, so you're saying, Rene, I think, I think you hit on a very interesting word or two words, which is never fear. And then the other two sets of the word is acquiring knowledge. It's not easy, you know, you were at the top of a billion dollar organization and then you decide to walk away because you would like to acquire knowledge. Obviously not, it's, it's not, you know, something, you know, everyone would do, but I'm sure there must have been uncertainty, right? It's like when you're leaving a big organization, um, you don't know what the path ahead is going to be like. You're going back to zero, going back to, you know, taking the risk and so on. So, so how did you manage that? And, you know, what would your advice be to, you know, other younger entrepreneurs and, and, and professionals who are also thinking about this? You know, they may have a cushy job right now or they may be in some organization and they're trying to make that leap. Like, what inspired you? And, and we'd love to hear your advice on that. Happiness is not measured by a sign of dollars. Uh, it's, uh, it's measured by the level of liberty that you have. 
Absolutely. And uh, uh, I recall, you know, a teacher telling me that when I was, you know, a young kid at the high school. He told me, because I didn't have a clue what I would do and how I would uh, work out this issue of not having access to uh, higher education because of my family situation. And he right. told me, he said, look, Rene, uh, you should not look at that as really an issue because in life you can decide to do whatever you want as long as you decide to become the best in the world in that specific field. You can only do that if you feel liberty. Yeah. And that will work if you take that approach. Uh, obviously, some people may be afraid to take such an approach at life, but I always got much more by having that approach than uh, uh, following people who are not really bringing me you know, that level of liberty. Uh, and I think particularly uh, for a young entrepreneur, this is key. This is key because the, the, uh, a young entrepreneur is in the heart of, of an idea. Right. Uh, you cannot generate an idea without feeling you're free uh, to bring that idea. So, and it, it's funny that you asked that question because when I decided to step down from that position at Rogers, it's like, you know, suddenly I became younger by 10 years. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I started to see, you know... Uh, did, I, I did the white hair stop? <laughs> well, I'm not, I'm not sure, but at okay. least, you know, I had <laughs> more down. fun. Definitely more okay. fun. <laughs> okay. But uh, to be honest, I, I had a lot of fun as well working with these people. But right. And I had a lot of respect for, 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 uh, for these people. And I still have a lot of good friends at Rogers and respect for that Absolutely. amazing organization. But it was not me. Yeah. Uh, and uh, if you want to accomplish something, if you want to share knowledge and people will use that knowledge, you need to have the capability to acquire the knowledge that will be useful uh, for the others. Uh, so that's, that's basically... Uh, uh, the situation so um you've you've left a billion dollar organization you're at the top for the acquisition of knowledge and you know i call it doing interesting shit um sometimes you just want to do interesting stuff um and then you go back with your team and then you decide to go from you know the telecommunication behemoth to the disruption, uh, you know, part of this business, which is the satellite industry, can can you talk a bit about yeah. that that yeah. that switch and 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 why why that that area? What was the vision and the thought? Yeah, there was a transition between the two. Oh, okay. Uh, again, when we made that pitch in two thousand seven uh, to uh, bankers in New York on uh, what would be uh, the transition of uh, internet to wireless network, and they didn't believe us. <laughs> So uh, I said, okay, in that case, you know, why not putting my money, you know, straight in Facebook and Google and, uh, and, and leave uh, for fun. So I, I took a, a year off. Uh, I uh, bought, you know, an open ticket for Athens uh, for one year and decided to discover this great, uh, this great society with, with the goal to understand where we're, we all come from, you know, in this Western world, what, what are the basis uh, the basis of our values, and 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 I learned a lot. It uh, again. So so okay. P uh, let's pause here for a second. Um, so you left the organization, then you decide to go on a sabbatical um, to find, I guess, meaning, purpose, and why we as human beings are here. And you decided Greece. Can you talk a bit about that? What led to that? Like, why did you decide to leave? And and. Um, yeah, what, what, what made you leave and try to rediscover yourself? Well, since our project was not really uh, progressing, uh, we just dis decided to stop working on that okay. specific project. And we said, let's, let's, let's regroup. Okay. Uh, let's reflect on what will be next. Let's come back with another project. And I really felt it was a perfect moment for taking that year off. Uh, I uh, had lost my mother as well during that time. Sorry so to hear that. It, it was yeah. it was it was for me an occasion to go back to the basis uh, roots, uh, the basic roots of my uh, Western world uh, values, way of thinking, right? Uh, that we always promote, you know, as being appar apparently the best of the world. 
So at one point, you need to re-challenge that yourself. Right. Uh, and we always think that we're told that we're better than everybody else in the world. And it's, it, for me, it's, it's too much. Yeah. Uh, uh, particularly uh, with my past experiences where I discovered so many things and learned so many things from different cultures. So I went, I went back there. I uh, had studied the Roman Empire before. I uh, have always been overwhelmingly uh, interested in the history of ancient civilizations. So I just wanted to know before the Romans what happened you know, in that uh, special area of the, of the world. And I, I could talk about it for, for hours <laughs> and, and, and even, even a week, you know, uh, telling you all kinds of things I did there to discover back myself. Uh, but in fact, I realized that uh, what the values that we're promoting today existed before in the history. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, we tend to forget that what we have could disappear in a very short period of time. And then, you know, it could take, you know, centuries to rebuild that if we're not careful. Uh, so, so, Th this had an impact uh, on, on how, you know, I would foresee the following years when I came back. And uh, I really realized uh, that having access to knowledge, sharing knowledge and values is even more critical. And this is kind of a protection uh, against, you know, uh, these traps that you can fall uh, if you don't consider all the aspects of, of, of your daily lives. Um, and can you talk about some traps when you say these traps? Uh, the traps uh, are the traps, I would say, which are the most critical to keep an eye on are the inequalities uh, that you see in life. Rich versus poor, uh, educated versus uneducated, uh, connected uh, versus disconnected. Right. Uh, I would say... Uh, um, knowledge acquiring active people versus knowledge non acquiring non-active people basically it all Passive, creates yeah. all these things are creating gaps uh, a gap is a source of instability in a society yeah and when you have this instability you can expect that people who are not you know at the top of the scale will try to improve their situations with different means right and this, this has happened all the time in the history of the world and will, will happen again. Yeah. Uh, so when we talk about new technologies and uh, what the technologies are bringing to the society, we always need to keep that in mind, in my point of view. Got it. And so you come back from these insights and reinvigorate it. Um, and then what happened? Well, again, my former colleagues uh, gave me a call and said, hey, geez, we have a new idea <laughs> this, ti this time. This yeah. is really a long, yeah. a long, w long run uh, one. But uh, there was some uh, discussions, uh, very early discussions uh, at the ITU level, the International Telecommunication Union level, uh, at the end of uh, that decine. Uh, uh, about that one day, uh, satellites and wireless networks would be interconnected in an efficient way. And uh, you would be able to have, you know, an integrated uh, satellite uh, slash uh, cellular service in the same device. That was the vision. Wow. That was the vision. We need to recall that 80% of the earth is still not covered by wireless networks. So uh, when you are out of uh, the wireless coverage, uh, it has a huge impact on today's uh, on today's life. I'll, yeah. I'll explain you why. And productivity. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. My vision is that right now, the world that we see is becoming, you know, the minority part of that world. Uh, yeah. Everything that was built with the, the new technology, social networks, uh, virtual, virtual technology and stuff like that, cre have created a monster, uh, a monster of virtual things. Right. A virtual world. If you talk to a teenager today, probably the largest part of his or her world is virtual. The moment you get disconnected from the technology, 
because the technology yeah. is not there, you lose most of your world. Yeah. Uh, just to illustrate how big an impact it is. Absolutely. Uh, so if you want to avoid that, because uh, this is also part of what I was explaining before, when you're disconnected, then you have a gap. Inequalities, people outside versus inside, you know, coverage. They're not the same beast anymore. And that, that will create wars at one point if we don't bridge, bridge that gap. So the way, I believe, uh, to bridge that gap is to use the satellites because uh, the terrestrial technologies uh, would, could, ca cannot be deployed efficiently in such remote areas. And uh, in 2008, 2009, that was really at the beginning of, uh, of that thinking. And, and did you pitch this to investors? We acquired, uh, we had an opportunity to acquire an asset uh, which, uh, which is basically, which was a spectrum, a, right. s a spectrum, uh, a license spectrum, uh, a spectrum license, I, I would say, uh, providing uh, the capability to use it for satellite services as well as cellular services. Right. Th that was a first in the world. Uh, and uh, we knew there would be a lot of work to do on the regulatory side because they were not there at all. But on the technical side, there were mo there were more and more discussions, you know, uh, saying that this would would come in the future. Right. Uh, so we made we made a bet. Uh, we acquired that asset. I, w I would say, you know, at a pretty reasonable price, since nobody. Nobody believed in uh, that it would really happen in the future, but we knew it That's would great. come. Yeah. It would take 5, 10, 15, 20 years, but it would come. And in the last few years, you started to see projects like uh, OneWeb, SpaceX uh, emerging. Uh, they're not at, uh, at the finish yeah. line for sure, but this is a f an illustration that things are going there. And, and when you reached out to investors, did they laugh at you guys again? Well, uh, <laughs> to be honest, we were not in the position to pitch to the same big, big guys Fair enough, uh, yeah. because the project, the scale of the project in the early smaller. years yep. was much smaller. But some people trusted that this this was going to happen one day, and uh, and they bet on it, and they made money with that. Okay, that's good. Uh, now we are uh, arriving at a very important threshold of our uh, of our project. We need to launch now the satellite service uh, in March 2020, and uh, wow. and we'll have also you know a, a cellular terrestrial capacity capability I would say deployed by Telus, uh, uh, which became a partner you know uh, with us in, in in the rollout of that uh, of that project. And that's only the first step. Uh, this, is, this is really something that will uh, become a true, uh, meaningful reality. Right now, I would say it's kind of a proof of concept. But with the deployment of 5G in uh, the terrestrial infrastructures right. in the next five years, uh, the interconnection of uh, these terrestrial networks with satellite networks uh, using potentially the 5G standard, uh, universal yep. 5G standard, then you will see something extremely uh, magical. Uh, magical appearing. Uh, you will create <laughs> with 5G, a, I would say, a neurological uh, web of devices yep. uh, of about 15 billion units. Uh, around the world, all and each of them with some artificial intelligence capabilities. Yeah, I mean, my sense is that, you know, 5G is a huge enabler for um, decentralized, you know, computation, Internet of Things, VR. It, it makes a whole set of new technologies just take off. And then if you add... And I love your way of saying, you know, we have entire generations growing up in the virtual world. That is their world first, right? Um, and if they lose connectivity, like, for example, if I go uh, to a chalet in the woods and I don't have my data, I get frustrated, right? And I'm a millennial, right? There, there's there's Gen Zs and, and so on. They're even more connected. Um, yeah, like having that intermesh of satellite and terrestrial is the way to go. Yeah, I, I think 
when you go out of coverage, you're not losing access to your data. Right. You're losing access to your world. Yeah. And uh, everything that this world represents for you. It's not only data, it's emotions, it's friends, it's a network, it's, it's your life. You are such uh, an amazing marketer. <laughs> it's yeah. Very few people can take something like a spectrum and, and, and satellites and turn it into an emotion. So I, I, I got to hand it out to you, Renee. Yeah. Like, it's uh, awesome. Uh, actually, the spectrum is only the invisible highway, you know, to transport yeah. that, that, those feelings uh, to the end users. For sure, uh, and, uh, and that's my that's the w that's that's the reason why we never sell, uh, we never sold uh, these products with the perspective that they are devices. Right, they are a customer experience. They are a set of emotions you can live, or you could not live without that. It's it's, uh, and that that's key, I think, in uh, in bringing value to a, a community. Right. Uh, and maintain, you know, uh, stability in a community, happiness. Uh, use it as much as you can to decrease potential inequalities. And uh, that's, that's how you need to look at the technology. Because if you don't look at it this way, and this is a dangerous path that we could end up, uh, if we don't look at it this way, that will become a new way to exploit Right, certain uh, categories of people, and that's a real danger. For sure. Uh, with the emergence of uh, 5G and uh, the artificial intelligence, the real challenge, if we come back to this sharing uh, uh, information story, the, f the first step is acquiring knowledge. The second step is really your ability to share that knowledge to, to, to colleagues around you so you become you know, a winning team and you continue to learn through that process. Uh, the third step is, is really to be able to maintain that knowledge relevant uh, in a context that all this, these new technologies will increase massively the pace of, of knowledge uh, acquisition. Oh yeah. Machines will ac acquire knowledge faster than a normal individual. Uh, so if you want to uh, remain relevant uh, in the society, you will need to find a way, you know, to cope with that, right, that right. pace of innovation and, and learning. And as a new graduate today, I would see my biggest challenge as maintaining that pace of learning at a level which will allow me to compete with these machines uh, or else I will become irrelevant, uh, obsolete somehow, you know, uh, and dependent. Uh, on, on the technologies. And that, that's for me a real threat, particularly in a world where you start to see uh, robot organizations uh, trying to uh, attack uh, all companies and networks yeah. uh, around the world. So but that, that's part of the challenge. And so how do we tackle with this threat? And, and, and the reason I'm saying this is, you know, being a tech entrepreneur and you know when you spend time you know in the silicon valley culture we see this i mean this is not something that may happen it is it's only a question of how quickly in fact in certain areas automation is is going it is disrupting many industries um you know i'll take you know transportation as an example first we had you know the um um the sort of uh, gig economy or, 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 or sort of uh, liquidating, you know, um, of, of uh, your personal asset as an economy. So meaning Uber is a good example where instead of having this taxi industry, you now have people who have cars or Airbnb. You have an asset. You're just creating more liquidity by renting it out and so on. So that created a disruption. Uber disrupted the taxi industry quite extensively. And then the next layer is, well, let's remove the human element completely, right? So you have driverless cars. Uh, you may own the car. And while you're sleeping, the car is out doing its Uber duty. Um, and it generates income for you. And it just rolls back in and charges itself, right? So that's a you know a very um, near future reality that, that we're looking into. The other piece is, is even more disruptive is if you look at the trucking industry. So... I, 
I know a few folks, um, you know, from um, based out of uh, the Valley again, and 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 one of them is 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 a founder of a uh, truck automation um, company, and and their technology is being tested by some of the major fleets already, right? And and they can do the work. They can drive. In fact, they're much safer than human beings in terms of highway driving, which is the vast majority of of of, of the transport. And a lot of folks don't realize, but, you know, the trucking industry in the U.S. hires a lot of people. A significant portion of, of uh, you know, the population, um, especially if you're male and, and you want to make above a certain sort of income, it, it's trucking. So how do we deal in an age, and this is just the beginning, right? We have automation in, in, in areas and services that we thought were safe, accounting, legal, um, you know, retail. So how do we deal with this threat, as you say? Like, what is your opinion on this? This is, uh, I think, you know, a, a short-term problem. Uh, if you're capable to implement this vision of acquiring knowledge, uh, sharing knowledge, and all the time, everything, I believe, you know, in the future, you will uh, start to go at school at five, for instance, and you will need to stay at school until 75, somehow. Uh, it could be... Yeah, lifelong learning. Like in my field in education, that's what we call it. So learning. Uh, it's an attitude. Uh, it, could, it could be done in different establishment, in diff different models. It, you could be part of a trucker group, you know, capable to... Uh, feel that you're always at school. Uh, but this is all back to this notion that if you cannot cope with the pace of innovation, uh, that will be brought by technologies, artificial intelligence, you become irrelevant. Right. Uh, it, this is a threat. Yeah. So we need to admit that this is, this is going to be uh, a problem. And for those not capable to follow that path, Obviously, uh, the system we're in right now, if, if, if the system is not addressing those situations, you will only increase the inequalities. And instability. I and instability. And if you believe that this will remain forever like this, uh, you, you have people, you know, in the Middle East, you know, without education, destroying, you mm -hmm. know, yeah. very very advanced civilizations absolutely i mean uh, it's feasible and it's, it's 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 doable and we'll face that if we don't address these situations yeah and and if you look at places like afghanistan and iraq good examples right uh, afghanistan before the soviet invasion was you know they they actually had a cosmonaut up in space you know and everything rolled back <laughs> it's, it's 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 amazing how quickly things can change. Definitely something I, I was able to reflect on when I was in Greece in 2008. <laughs> right. The other thing I want to pick on is, and I see this as a pattern, and I know you for, like, we know each other for six, seven years now. Um, and that pattern is just the attitude, right? The intent and the attitude makes a big difference. And I'm not going to go into like stoicism and this whole, you know, other field. Since you read Roman history, you're probably familiar with that. Um, but, you know, how we approach a problem and, and what's inside our head, right? Our, our capacity to manage our emotions versus our emotions managing us. I find that's, that's a very consistent trait in most of the successful people I know. And... What's amazing is, you know, you've been in different situation, whether you were in PwC, you came from college with the intent and the attitude to learn and, and share that knowledge. And, you know, that has helped you rise to the top. And then you left for the same reason. And can you talk a bit about, you know, this attitude, you know, how it came about and is this an important part of your your sort of character and you feel that you know it's it's, it's a strong um, character building aspect for folks to have I'm sure you c we can all build that 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 character but I think in my particular case I feel 
I, I feel bad when I, I, I cannot, you know, contribute. Right. Because I don't know enough. Uh, it's, it's difficult, you know, to be part of a winning team if you don't bring your contribution oh, yeah. to the winning team. Yeah. And I was always uh, uh, telling that to my, my uh, employees and my, my colleagues. You don't choose to be part of a team. It's the team who will choose if you're part of it. Right. So you have to demonstrate that you're bringing something. It's your own responsibility to make sure you have something to offer. Uh, and in my case, when I was feeling that I needed to take a step back, regroup, reflect, uh, uh, realign, I never hesitated to do that because I always felt free to do it. Uh, and I organized my life, you know, to make sure that uh, when I was going to make a decision like that, I would not hurt, you know, that many people uh, and they will understand. Uh, and to be honest, I believe that I have been a much happier man because I was able to do that. <laughs> right. And I hope that I will be able to do that until the end of my life because uh, learning is exciting. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's always amazing what you, you, you discover you can do with, uh, with knowledge. Um, not only on a pure a factual basis, but the level of discussion and relationship that it will bring to you. You'll have the occasion to have much more rewarding discussions with people and know much more from them, learn much more from them because of that. They, they will open their mind if you feel that you can get there. Uh, it's, it's, it's key. Uh, I believe if you want to uh, to be happy in life. I, I coached uh, quite a lot of young entrepreneurs and even, you know, uh, kids uh, in high school. Uh, right. And just, just with that approach, you know, in certain cases, uh, I've been overwhelmed by the impact it had on them. You know, I, I could not believe, <laughs> you know, that sometimes just having a few words and the right attitude can bring them to believe that they can conquer the world. Yeah. Uh, so we should not be afraid to take a step back. Uh, it's not an indication of weakness, as uh, so many people are usually looking at it uh, this way. Uh, I believe uh, taking a step back is a proof that you can uh, reconsider things you're doing, accept you're making mistakes, learn from these mistakes, and become stronger. Yeah, and what you're saying is basically the premise of modern civilization, which is what we call the scientific method, right? Um, which is about making observations and then validating it with data. And if your data and hypothesis are incorrect, you iterate on that until you get closer and closer. Now, obviously, when it comes to an experiment or numbers, uh, it's easier to do. But when it comes to people and emotions, it's slightly trickier. It is. Uh, it is. But uh, you know what? Um, I don't know if this is the same for everybody. But in my case, when I get too involved in a business project, uh, you tend to uh, be skewed toward, you know, uh, the rational side of the life. Yeah. And the only way to recapture what emotions can bring to you is to allow these emotions, you know, to take place. Sometimes you need to, uh, uh, to step away, uh, to, uh, to go elsewhere, to do something different, just to reopen that part of your heart right. uh, and learn from, from that. Uh, probably when I went to Greece in 2008, it was probably the most uh, emotional moment about my life. Uh, so many times during that trip, I told myself, why didn't that, didn't that do at that before? Right. Uh, and when I came back, all these emotions that I felt down there gave me a very different perspective how to look at problems, opportunities, uh, ways of asking questions uh, to obtain more information from colleagues, respect 
uh, toward difference. Uh, because a, a good team, and, and that's probably the reason why I'm still, you know, with my colleagues that uh, I, I, I met, you know, at Microsoft, we're all different. Yeah. Uh, we, we're so different, we will never, you know, debate uh, somehow uh, something w we're going to trust the expertise of the colleagues. Yeah, it's funny. It reminds me of, of, of my founding team. Uh, we're all so different. And, and, and we don't always agree on everything. And that's part of like when you have a room full of smart individuals, you're going to have uh, differences of, of ideas. And that's sort of where I learned another insight, which is, you know, what I call, you know, the best ideas are often a dissension of opinions, not a consensus of yeses, right? Um, so, so I found that interesting and that you mentioned that as well. So, uh, That's exactly the approach I was taking, you know, uh, in FIDO when uh, we recaptured the market in, uh, with City FIDO. Uh, there was a rule in the team that they needed to consult their colleagues to make sure that they would make, you know, an inventory of all the opinions that would be different than, than their opinion. And uh, that was, that was uh, for me, easy to, to, uh, to make decisions because the first question I was always asking them, who did you consult before, right. before you, uh, you ended up with this recommendation? Knowing all and each of them, I could see what they had faced in terms of debate. And I was much more confident when they were coming to me with a recommendation that they had gone through this thought process. Right. And uh, they, ha they had looked at the, the, the pros and cons and the risks. And, and, and also it created, you know, a new relationship with these people. They, they, they stopped fearing the different opinions. Instead, they were seeking that just to make sure they would not forget anything important. And that has always been my approach, you know, in, in managing teams. I'm not afraid to show what I think. Right. And ask if this is the right thing. Uh, because in the end, I always ended up having a much better decision. Yeah, and, and it's what we call today authentic leadership, right? It's, it's, it's super important. And especially in today's world where your most valued asset or input is human capital. It is people. Everything else, you know, capital is not difficult to raise. Um, and with historically low interest rates, I mean, that's it's almost uh, being commoditized at this point. Um, the problems are there and the problems are growing. It's not lack of problems. It's really getting a group of smart, gifted individuals, passionate individuals coming together and, and trying to solve a problem, right? Yep. And it, that's, that's not easy as well. It is not easy, but as part of the, the, the goal to maintain knowledge uh, relevant, up to date, right. uh, you need to be able to deal with that type of uh, approach. Because I, I doubt that robots will be good at creating ideas. I think they, they, they are extremely good at trying, learning from these, these error, the, the errors and stuff like that. But a new idea, I think this is the space that could remain, you know, our garden for a while if we learn how to uh, appreciate the opinion of each other's. Yeah, for a while, I would say, because um there are some interesting um, AI startups or companies. One of them is in the uh, pharmaceutical space that is creating new rules on d drug discoveries and so on. So it is interesting, um, you know, when we talk about AI and creativity, um, there's also a very famous um, um, example of uh, an AI that's composing music and, and you know, for, for, even with experts, they can't tell the difference. Um, and it's just composing and creating its own music. So, yeah. yeah. All right, so next, I think one of the questions that, you know, I'm curious about, and, and I know quite a few folks are, is this whole spec spectrum wars, spectrum, you know, 
everyone's trying to find a certain spectrum and 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 kind of capture it in the telecom space um can you talk about that what's what's happening then i know a bit of it because i, I studied physics but um you know folks that are interested in the telecommunication space are always fascinated by the spectrum wars and why is spectrum you know sort of the holy grail or or the highways of 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 this industry and communication can you can you tell us a bit about that well i believe this is because this is a scarce uh resource uh spectrum scarce? is scarce uh, yeah it's a limited uh, yeah. it's a limited resource uh and the traffic is 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 increasing dramatically but the resource is still is still you know limited uh, can you explain how it's a limited resource just for folks who don't know well you know uh, a spectrum uh, band, for instance, is split in megahertz. Uh, let's say you take a band of five megahertz. It's, it's, let's look at it like you know a highway of five, five you know lanes. Right. Uh, you can put a certain number of cars on it, but uh, after that you need additional spectrum. But if you only have a certain number of bridges around the city and you cannot build additional bridges because there is nothing available for that, then you need to figure out ways to increase the traffic on, on the bridges, and by default, the value of, of these bridges will increase dramatically. Yeah. Uh, so in this case, spectrum would be the bridges, and cars would be the data flow, right? Exactly. Okay. Th- and that's it. And, and then you, you have a lot of spectrum available, but depending on the, on, on the length of uh, the frequencies of the, of, of, of the band. So we're talking about the wavelength? Yeah, the yeah, wavelength. Okay. okay. Uh, you don't have the same characteristics. You cannot transport the same uh, type of data with the same speed. For instance, low bands like 600 megahertz are really good to reach a much longer distance, yeah. but are weaker in terms of capacity to transport a large volume of data. Whereas if you go in the three gigahertz uh, band or two uh, t- two megahertz band, uh, or uh, then, uh, the two gigahertz, but then you can reach less far. It's uh, it cannot go as right. far, uh, but you have more capacity. You can put more cars on it. So it, it's like uh, you have a shorter bridge with more lanes. Wider, yeah. But in certain case, you have a longer bridge, but you cannot put more than two lanes on it. Uh, and and then you need to manage with that. You need a portfolio to ensure that you have good coverage of the geography. Whereas in large cities where you have a high density population, you need to have a lot of capacity. Right. For instance, in these cases, you will you you will you will uh, use a spectrum in the higher bands, and then it's it's market. Uh, it's a market. Right. The governments are uh, allocating or selling, uh, auctioning uh, the spectrum bands. It has to be coordinated around the world because uh, if you want to have a, an international ecosystem, if you want this phone to work, you know, in uh, different countries, you need a minimum of consistency in how you allocate the bands around the world. Uh, and the value of a spectrum band is you always based on the number of megahertz pop that you get uh, in a given area. For instance, uh, just to give an example, you have, uh, let's say in Toronto, uh, 6 million people and you have 5 megahertz. It's 5 megahertz times 6 million will give you, let's say, 30 uh, million megahertz pop. And then you, ha- you can have a price on this per megahertz pop. It could be $2, for instance, right. or it could be $5. And that's, that's a market that works like that. Obviously, the governments uh, are looking at around the world uh, with the help of the ITU are looking at ways to issue much more spectrum right. uh, in the future, but that spectrum will have different characteristics. If they're in a very high bands, they could be extremely uh, efficient to transport a very, very uh, high quantity of data, but on a very short like distance. A b- like a Bluetooth. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now, that had no value in the past because we were mainly looking at geographical coverage. Yeah, but yeah. in the future, uh, with the emergence of 5G uh, deployment and the, the machine-to-machine decentralized uh, computation, yeah. devices, in a, in a room like here, you may end up having 30 
different uh, devices Sensors, yeah. uh, using you know wireless spectrum since they're close to each other you can probably use very high bands you know in, in, in a case like that so that sounds like an interesting business idea for the future it is, and uh, you just <laughs> need to yeah. follow what's going on in that space, and you'll see it's always interesting to see when there is a transaction between two companies involving Spectrum. The first right. thing you try to understand is what is the price they paid for the Spectrum. Right. And, and, and so what's happening in this space? Well, right now... What are the future trends? The future trends is you will have humongous quantities of Spectrum, you know, issued by governments uh, in the much higher bands, uh, 30 gigahertz band, 20 gigahertz band, even 50 gigahertz band. My view is that these bands will be useful in the 5G, you know, environment, most likely for very, very short distance, asking right. for a big, big debit of data. It will happen, but now it's not clear. The, the if you look at the price of these bands today, it's minimal, because. Uh, you still have to go through a certain number of key steps from a technological standpoint, a lot of testing to figure out what will be the op optimum, optimal way to use that spectrum. A lot of work to be done still at the 3GPP. It will take uh, four or five years before we start to get right. clarity on the how it will work. Right. Uh, now we believe it will work, but the how and how we will implement that is still to be defined. That world doesn't exist yet. Just like landlines, remember when you're trying to pitch City Fido, and investors are laughing, yeah. but uh, this is how the world is. Yeah. Data is the number one usage on your smartphones. It's not your voice communication. Exactly. Voice is a tiny part you know, of the traffic these days. And, and to close it off, um, is there any, any, any sort of... Uh, Final advice as as you look down, um, you know, into the future, especially for like you know young folks, um, where you mention the biggest threat is going to be you know competing with machines that are becoming smarter and smarter. I would add to that climate change as being a big one as well that you know the next generation, our generation is going to inherit. Um, anything else you want to add to that, or any 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 feedback? You know when I. I came out of uh, the university, I had my full baggage of knowledge and I was way ahead, you know, of the machines at that time. I could <laughs> use that to... You could beat him uh, chess at that point, uh, I think. I, I, yeah. I, I was able to bring something very quickly. Today, you look at uh, these, uh, these new graduates. For me, they're the first generation of this world which are coming out of university and already they're at threat of being obsolete yeah, because the machines behind. are uh, more uh, are faster in terms of knowledge uh, learning than they could be so my advice to them is if they thought that uh, or if they think that they know a lot uh, it, they have to change their mindset because right. they they have to to get involved in a process where they will compete uh, with the learning speed of these machines. I don't have the answer, but I only know that uh, this is not hitting only them. It, this is a thing now everybody in the society. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, my advice is uh, think about that and make sure that you're going to continue learning uh, at high speed and focus on the creative part of it and bringing the new ideas because it's quite kind of a, a wall garden that we can still live in for a while uh, right. because I don't think the machines will get there uh, for a certain period of time, obviously, but uh, that's, that's my view. Uh, but I think the challenge is, is, is huge, but it's always possible to find ways. Uh, it is always possible. So let's end on that note um, that it's always possible and thank you so much, Renee, for your time, for your feedback, for your wisdom, for your insights. I, I, I loved, I just love your journey, right? It inspires me so much of where you came, you know, from a background of not much, but all you had was your, you know, ability and, and attitude to acquire knowledge. 
with humility. And from there, you acquired knowledge, you went all the way to the top to a major, you know, billion dollar corporation, and then left to continue to acquire that knowledge. And, and you continue to disrupt what's, what's, what's happening um, in, in this industry. So thank you so much for your time. And, and it was absolutely awesome. And we look forward to inviting you again. So It was a real pleasure. Cool. Thank you very much. Thanks. All right. Hi. If you like the podcast, head over to our exclusive insight section, where our guests will dive deeper on actionable insights that can help transform your life.